I got it on. I guess you better check it just to be safe. I got two mics on. I got a recorder going. We have the video. What we got going? All this technology. All it takes is a power outage and we're out of luck. But anyway, uh, let's hope that doesn't happen. Uh, we're, we're glad to see everybody here today, uh, even our visitors. And so uh, we're glad you came our way. And, um, you know, last week was New Year's. And how many have kept up with their New Year's resolution? Anybody? We got one hand back there. I can tell you what a resolution was. I ain't making no resolutions this year. What I end up doing. <clears throat> but anyway, um, we, we, we talk about that. And sometimes we make goals for ourselves. And we realize the goals that we set up sometimes might be out of reach. Like, I, I, I put on a little bit of weight recently, so I, I need to get back to my original weight. And I can sit there and figure out, well, I, I need to drink less water, eat less food, do a little more exercise. But six pounds, eight ounces is just not realistic for me. And that's what we do sometimes when we make goals for ourselves. We make a goal that's really unrealistic. And we need to learn to bring it down closer uh, to what is more in reality. And so we talk about this, and oftentimes we are comfortable about where we are and where we've been. And we realize that, and we feel good about ourselves, but our comfort is not to be trusted. As Avery mentioned in class, from our Friday night class, I mean, the problems of our temptation are within us. I mean, that's where it comes from. James chapter 1, 15 through 17 tells us that. It starts within ourselves. I mean, when sin comes about, that's where it starts. It's seated there, and then it grows, and then it um, continues on. And so reality check tells us there's a lot of things that we want to think everything is okay. Well, all you have to do is turn on the TV, and you'll see. See, nothing is okay these days. I mean, you turn on the news and listen to that. It's not okay. This world is messed up. It is in all sorts of strange things that some of us, we never even pictured it would be this bad so quickly. We figured we'd still have a few more generations before this country turned into what it is today. And it just kind of boggles the mind. If you've been paying attention for the last 20 years, you have seen drastic changes in our country and the culture that we live in. And so sometimes the future is not as bright as we hoped it would be. And we, we sit down there and we just grieve over our children and our grandchildren because, you know, the Bible says it's going to get worse. And you think, well, how can it get any worse than this? Well, believe me, it can. And so we, we have to look at this. So reality check. See, this is where we separate the perception into reality. You know, sometimes we get in our mind, this is the way it is, and all of a sudden, boom, we're struck with the facts. No, it's not. It's not that way. And this is where we separate the, our opinion from facts. Everybody loves their own opinions, and, and they love to express their opinions. And yet, sometimes those opinions don't line up with facts, or facts is just another word for truth. And, and so they, they, they get their opinions, and they ignore the truth. Now, when we can develop ourselves where our opinions are in line with the facts, well, that's really not even an opinion anymore. I mean, it's, we might call it that, but it's not our opinion. And when we look at the Bible, you're never going to see any opinions in the Bible. You're not going to find my opinion. You're not going to find your opinion. You're going to find the truth is what you're going to find. And this is where we separate our fantasy and see what is really going on. A lot of, a lot of people, you know, we, we talk about people walking around with rose-colored glasses. 
they, they have their, their perception, everything's okay. Even in the fact that we live in probably the greatest country that's ever existed on the face of this planet, even though we live here, we, we, we just get into our own little world, and as long as nothing disrupts our little world, we're okay with that. And reality jumps in and says, your world isn't like that. I mean, some people want to say, okay, well, we live in the age of leave it to beaver. I mean, the wife stays home. She washes clothes. She gets up, dresses, puts on her makeup every morning, makes all the beds, has the house spotless, vacuums, cleans, cooks the meals for when the husband comes home and then uh, have to deal with the children. We don't live in that kind of world anymore. I mean, it's gone. And, and we have to reali realize that. So this is where we really need to see God's view of things that are, that are, and we should try to view them the same way God views them. And that, that's where, where it is. So in other words, if sin is an abomination to God, it should be an abomination to us. And, and so that, that's, that's, I can't say it any other way. And that's, that's what's the problem in this world. This world calls evil good and good evil. And there, this world and our political system is promoting every sin that God said was an abomination. And those who speak up and say, that's not right, well, we're the evil people. Well, so be it. That's reality now that we are faced with. See, our recent elections, and I'm, I'm going back maybe 20 years here, we, we revealed a lot about our fellow citizens. And here, perhaps we should view that this as a wake-up call. And it's really not really going to be a wake-up call because reality is already setting in for us. And perhaps we thought we lived in a society that respected God and his word. Not anymore. It's not that way anymore. We were wrong if we thought that. And it has become obvious that the majority of our fellow citizens approve of sin and every sort of evil. I mean, we're, we're talking like that. And, yeah, we used to call this a Christian nation. It never has been a Christian nation. Yes, years ago, people had more respect for God's word, and they did read the Bible, and they honored the Bible. They don't do that anymore. Used to be when you went into a, a court of law to make a testimony, you put your hand on the Bible and said, I swear to tell the truth. They don't even use Bibles anymore in our courts of law. And, and so they don't do that. And they don't even, they probably ask people, are you going to tell the truth or not? <laughs> That's probably what I ask them. And, and we already know what's going to happen. If they're a witness for the prosecution, well, they're going to tell their version of the truth. And if they're a witness for the, uh, the, the one being charged, well, they're going to give their perception of what they think it should be. I mean, so it does that. Folks, welcome to World of Reality Check. We're faced with this every day. And we should be paying attention. And the Bible tells us. We need to be paying attention. See, most of us would like to think the people around us are good moral people with principles worthy of God's approval. Well, if you just stay, hang around your brethren and don't get with anybody else, okay, that might be the right thing. But when we get out in this world, we're dealing with people who do not have good moral principles and they don't have God's approval. God never approves of sin in any form. And so, while a few of us might be blessed to be surrounded by such people, and honestly, we can say preachers usually uh, fall in this category. Some, some preachers, uh, basically, they never have any contact with worldly people other than maybe at the grocery store or meeting people at Walmart or something, but they spend most of their time with the brethren. And so for many years, they become insulated. I, I, I remember a preacher I was uh, working with one time, and he told me, you know, my life has been insulated so much. I have no idea what's going on. And, and so 
I, I spent 30 years in the workforce, so I knew what was going on. And so I, I, I could express it from a more of a reality viewpoint than what this preacher's from his insulated viewpoint. And so it, it made more sense. So reality, reality tells us that is not the case anymore. And, and so when, when immorality is approved by the people, it should tell us that we have failed in spreading the word of God. And that, that's, that's the only way to say it. We haven't done our job. And I accuse the preachers of this land because it used to be the preachers of this land would say, that's not right. We shouldn't allow such things. Now what do they do? Oh, we approve of that now. I mean, even preachers in the Church of Christ who have become popular, they have all of a sudden decided to issue statements and press releases. Well, I know what I said before was offensive to some people, and I really regret doing that. What the man spoke was the word of God, and he regrets speaking the word of God. God does not approve of this person. And he shouldn't approve of us if we tolerate, if we put up with, if we endorse or promote any of these things. And so, see, when drunkenness and getting high are placed on the ballot, you know, people want it that way. Believe me, if it shows up on a ballot, enough people have said enough words that, okay, well, let's put this on the ballot. That's what the people want. And when abortion is placed on the ballot, you know, people want it that way. And never mind that God said abortion is murder. I mean, well, yeah, we got to have abortion. That's, that's got to be a, I mean, that, that's got to be there. And every sin that God has condemned has been adopted into our sinful society and it's even glorified. I mean, it doesn't matter what sin you're talking about. It's been glorified in some way, and they, they protect those who want to practice this sin, and they, they, they try and make it hard for anybody who wants to say otherwise. See, if such things are going to be put on the ballot, that tells us society has already accepted it. They've already accepted it. It's not... Okay, we come up with a situation, well, are we going to do this or not? No, if it's, if it's on the ballot, most of society has already accepted it. They just want to make it legal. <laughs> they they want to allow people to marry in the same sex. They just had to get it, get it on the law books and do like that. You know, soft and hard drugs, a multi-billion dollar industry. And you wonder, well, well, drugs are bad for you. Why, why is it continuing? Because there's money involved. Exactly. If there was no money involved, it wouldn't be happening. Just like sex, a multi-billion dollar industry, whether, whether it's pornography and people paying money to watch porn on the Internet, or if it's buying magazines with dirty pictures in it, or if it's going and having your way with children or animals or people of the same sex. I mean, whatever. It's a multi-billion dollar industry. Gambling is a multi-billion dollar industry. They make money off of this. And when people are making money, woohoo, everything's good. Take the money away, what happens to it? It's gone. That reminds me, I, I was talking with a, a person one time at work, and he was talking about the fact that he was part of a band that played in these religious groups. And I asked him one time, what would happen if you took the band away? Well, the people would just leave. And he was honest enough to say that. I mean, the word of God cannot draw people, but your band draws people. You take the band away, what happens? Oh, they just leave. I mean, an honest conversation just like that. See, if there's money involved, people are going to continue, continue it until the profit is no longer there. I mean, if they weren't making money, they wouldn't be abducting these girls and put them in the sex trades. 
They wouldn't be abducting these little boys and putting them in the sex trade or making them work in the mines to, to get the blood diamonds and things like that if there wasn't money involved. And if there's money involved, somehow Congress has allowed it to take place because somebody's getting wealthy. And if somebody's getting wealthy, what are they going to do? Oh, we'll contribute to your finance, your re-election campaign. We'll give you money so you can do this. And you wonder why these people who have ordinary jobs get sent into Congress and a few years later they come out multimillionaires. Something is wrong there. And I don't think that was designed by the framers of our Constitution. These are supposed to be people representing their constituents. Now, the, 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 the representatives are telling the constituents, you've got to do it our way. They're the ones in charge. We're not in charge anymore. And they don't listen to us anymore. And we know that's the truth. Especially if we're trying to be moral people and say, you know, some things just aren't right. Oh, no, we can't listen to that because there is money involved. A lot of businesses do things because there's money involved. There's profit in it. I mean, we're always watching shows on television where someone comes up with an invention that would give us free, clean energy. And whether they're trying to squelch it, trying to put it out, trying to kill the people who are promoting this, buy the technology so they can bury it and stuff like that. Anything that'll be good for us, but if there's no money involved, we're not going to see it. It's not going to be there. Some radical changes will have to take place. And even though something is illegal, it does not stop those who want to do it. And we've seen that already. There are many things that were illegal several years ago. They're now legal. Why? How they're going to be doing it anyway. We might as well make it legal. And maybe we can even tax these products now that they're doing it. I mean, that's what they did in, in Nevada. They started taxing the, uh, the brothels and getting taxes for that. And, okay, money's coming in. Hey, as long as the money comes in, we're, we're just going to turn a blind eye. We're, we're not going to care if it's moral or anything like that. As long as the money's coming in, that's all we care about. See, that's the reality we're facing. And many things that were disgusting to us and are still disgusting to us are being accepted in our world. We don't like it. And they're throwing it in our face. The other night, Russell mentioned these TV commercials. I mean, all these commercials come up, guys kissing guys, women kissing women, and promoting a lifestyle just so they can try and sell their product so that they feel that they can be inclusive. Oh, we want to be inclusive of everybody. See, people may get high on pot and they may marry in the same sex. And abortion is legal in many places. I mean, I mean when the Supreme Court ruled this past year, did you hear, hear the uproar that went out, out about that? Oh, no, they're taking away our right to abortion. Well, the Supreme Court didn't do that. They just said, that's each state has to decide if they're going to do that or not. That's all they said. And then how quickly did that abortion right get put on the ballots. I know in California it was immediately put on there and then they voted on it. But we must remember that God has already spoken about the taking of innocent life. He's already said that. And that's not going to change because God doesn't change. And God still considers it an abomination. I mean, God has already spoken about continuing in sin. Mentioned Hebrews 10, 26. If therefore we continue in sin, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sin. And some people that way, they don't want to give up their sin. And sadly, a lot of people who seemingly appear to obey the gospel, they're not willing to give up their sin. Oh, they want to get baptized. So they, oh, I've been baptized. I'm on my way to heaven now. But they don't give up their sin. And they are deluded if that's how they feel and how they think. God has already spoken and warned us about the judgment to come. 
And now we have people, even ministers in the Church of Christ, well, well there, there, there's no need for a judgment because when people die, they're just going to be annihilated. They won't exist anymore. And they're teaching that. There is no such thing as hell. I mean, Church of Christ preachers are doing this. And more than just a few, sadly to say, and probably some very well-known preachers in the Church of Christ have doubted that there is something wrong or with instrumental music in the worship. I mean, we, we've been doing that. Oh, no, we don't do that. We don't worship with the instruments, but yet they've been adopting it all across the country. Women preachers, they're being adopted all around the country in different places. They're, they're letting women take that. They're letting women become elders. And I guess they have to be lesbian because they have to be the husband of one wife, right? So that, they're going to have to be that way. I, I mean, that, that's just crazy. But anyway, what God has said no to, people are adopting. And they're accepting it. And they're accepting it in the church. And why is the church doing it? Well, because the denominations have already done that for a long time. I mean, a lot of things the Church of Christ does, or a lot of churches, well, it's working for them. It's working for the denomination. They got a big crowd over there. What are they doing? Oh, they got entertainment going on. They, they're, they're providing food and, and meals for people, and they're, they're, they're doing some things like that. They're doing outreach, and they're, they're doing AA and, and all this other stuff, and they're approving of people and, and tell them, these things. Well, we got to do that too, because so we can get the numbers. But like I said, you take away those entertainment, you take away the the benefits and amenities. Are people going to keep coming? No, that's the reality setting in. I mean, so they're not being drawn by the gospel; they're being drawn by the hamburgers and the pizza and the pie. That's what they're doing. And so God has warned us about these things. And God has warned us about the judgment to come. And he reminds us several times in the scriptures that everyone will stand before God and give an account. And most members in the church of Christ don't even know that passage is in there. I guarantee a lot more can't tell you what verse it's found in or what verses, I should say, because it's in there quite a few times. But many members are just ignorant of God's word, and they don't know what's in the Bible. And as a result, like we talked in class, they don't know if the preacher's telling them the truth or not. They just have to trust him. He, he must know because he knows his Bible. And they don't study for themselves like the Bereans did. They don't verify See, the reality is if, if this country is going to make a comeback and improve, it will only happen if God is a part of that. I mean, that's the reality. And since these people have already expressed their dis, dislike of God, their animosity towards God or any of God's people, you think that's going to happen? Maybe if some sort of national tragedy took place. Maybe if some terrorist decided to detonate a nuclear bomb in one of our cities that killed millions of people, maybe it'll bring some people back into reality and say, you know what, we need God on our side. But anything short of a disaster of that nature that's going to take millions of lives is probably not going to affect people. You know, back 20 years ago, 9-11 took place. And for for about three weeks, you, all you could hear, well, we need to get back to God. We need to talk to God, and we need to pray to God and all this stuff. And then people just started getting comfortable and returned to their old lifestyle. See, that's reality. See, in 1 Samuel chapter 8, we read about a nation that decided to boot God out of their land. We don't want God. And that nation was God's own chosen people. I mean, and that, that's the way a lot of churches are. 
We don't want God telling us what to do. We want to do what we want to do. And so they wanted to be like the nations around them. And they had to have what the other nations had. They had a king. And that's what we want. And Samuel pleaded with them and begged with them, you don't want a king. He's going to do, he's going to take your daughters. He's going to take your sons and put them in battle. He's going to make your life miserable. He's going to tax you. He's going to treat you miserably. <coughs> oh no. We got to be like the nations around us. We want a king. And that's the state we're in today. See, the people were warned, but they said they wanted a king anyway. And the reality is they did not like God telling them how to live. That's what it comes down to. And that's what's happening in our churches today. People don't like God telling us what we're, how we're supposed to live. So don't tell us about God. Just like Isaiah chapter 30. You say, say to the seers, do not see visions. The prophets do not prophesy. Tell us, well, smooth words. I, I mean, so that's what they do. So the people rejected God as their king. And it's no different today. And recent events tell them most people in this country have done the same thing. And if you want to get honest, a lot of people in the church, and I'm talking Church of Christ, has done the same thing. See, it's very interesting that what is happening today in our country is precisely what happened in the past. I mean, let, let, let's face it. As we, as we go through the prophets, we, we realize so many things as we've studied on Wednesday nights in our prophets. I mean, that's exactly what's going on now. I mean, and, and we read about that. Isaiah, you, it just uh, basically, you, you grab Isaiah and compare it to the local newspaper. I mean, they're almost reading word for word sometimes. And, and so that's what we read about in the Bible. And we see many descriptions in the prophets of things they did that people today are now doing. I mean, so 1 Corinthians 10, 1 through 13, I mean, it instructs us to learn from the example of the Israelites and not follow their wayward path. I mean, 1 Corinthians 10, he starts off, these people came from under the cloud, they, they, they came through the Red Sea, and they immediately started grumbling and complaining. I mean, they just been released from slavery. I mean, we, we, we see how people react. The, I mean, with slavery is such a horrible, evil thing, and they're released from it. And what do they do? They start griping because they're hungry. I mean, that's what they did. So God said, <laughs> they, they got problems. They sent the spies into the land to investigate, and they came back with a report, and, uh, oh, no, no, they got giants. We're not going there. They didn't put their trust in God. They didn't put their trust in God once he got them across the Red Sea. They never put their trust in God, and they came into the land, and still, it says there arose a generation that knew not God. I mean, just one generation for were. Joshua stood up there in 24, 15, as for me and my house, we'll serve the Lord. And all the people said, yeah, yeah, that's what we're going to do. And it's obvious they wouldn't even teach their children about it because the next generation did not know God. And so that shows the importance of it. And many nations have, had ignored the warnings from God, and they ceased to exist. I mean, uh, all, all the nation we read about, they, they ignore God, and he caused them to go away. That's what God does. Daniel chapter 5 tells us that. That's what God does. And, and so uh, Daniel explained that to Nebuchadnezzar in chapter 2. God installs people. He puts people into positions of authority, and he does that. Sometimes we can't question that ourselves because, you know, there are some evil regimes on this planet. There's people who kill their own people, and they, they kill them by the millions. Oh, but that's not happening in this country, so we'll just turn a blind eye to it. Like I mentioned slavery a minute ago. Well, that was bad, but slavery is still going on today. And yet, it's not happening here in its true sense. 
but it's still going on in this world. I mean, these children are being taken and put into these sex situations, and if the kids don't do it, they're killed. That kind of motivates the others to go ahead and do it. Might as well. Nothing I can do about it. And, oh, oh, no, no. Remember the monkeys? See no evil. Hear no evil. Speak no evil. And I saw a meme yesterday. They had a fourth monkey now. He's playing on a cell phone. Doesn't pay attention to anything. <laughs> but anyway, reality informs us this country is on the same path. And it's going to cease. It's going to fall down. And, yeah, some of us who read the word of God, we recognize the signs. And, and we try and warn people. But our warnings fall on deaf ears, right? Oh, you're just a conspiracy theorist or something like that. And just shut shut this person up. We don't want to hear from that. And secular human history historians have documented these same type of events throughout history. And they're out there. But sadly, our histories are not being repeated and taught anymore. I mean, we're encouraged to learn from history so that we do not not make the same mistakes. And we hear that. If we don't learn from our past, we're doomed to repeat it. I mean, many people have said that. And, I mean, it's just as true. If you don't know that thing, I mean, it's like some of the, the teachings, like socialism. I mean, socialism has failed everywhere, but they're still promoting socialism. And a lot of people in this country, hey, that's a good idea. Everybody be equal. Everybody have the same income. Everybody have the same things. Oh, that sounds so good. Get rid of capitalism. But no, the people are not learning their histories so as to prevent them from making the same mistakes. And yeah, they're going to repeat the same mistakes. We know that. Just like the, the, the preacher said, what has been will be. What will be has already been. There's nothing new under the sun. So what can the righteous do to help solve the problem? We've talked about a lot of problems, and, and it'd be kind of pointless to talk about problems and say, okay, we're dismissed, and go from there without offering a solution. And a lot of people seem to do that. A lot of people seem to talk about all the problems and nitpick all the problems, but they don't offer any solutions. They just go away and leaves everybody depressed. All oh, this, I mean, we're in bad shape. We're, we're, we're not going to survive. I mean, we're, we're just bad shape. What can the righteous do to solve the problem? First of all, we need to make sure to give God glory and honor. And we must remain faithful to God. Despite what this world tells us, you, you need to be involved in this. You need to be participating in this uh, LGBT, QRST, you, whatever. I mean, you got to be involved in all that stuff. And you got to accept it. No. If we're going to remain faithful to God, we cannot accept sin. We've got to get rid of sin out of our lives. And, they, and if that means... We have to turn off the TV so we're not influenced by it, then so be it. I mean, you can't even watch a ball game without seeing a commercial of two guys kissing. You can't watch the ball game without them promoting some sort of uh, sexual dysfunction or something like that that you can correct with a pill or something. I mean, everything we do is talk about sex. If it's not promoting you doing the sex, they're, they're going to give you some sexy looking babe to tell you buy our product. Have you ever noticed you buy, you buy beer and everybody in the commercial is some, I mean, got a great body and, and a hunky looking guy and uh, very young and vital and so happy. What's the reality? You tank up on a case of beer and guess what? Whoop. Here comes the gut, and here comes the laziness, here comes the drunkenness, and you'll probably end up in jail being drunk, or you're going to go out and kill somebody. I mean, they don't look at that kind of that. So the Christian, what can the Christian do? 
is remain faithful to God. Like I said, it's not popular in our society, but there will be a reward for doing so. If we remain faithful until death, we'll get that crown of life, Revelation 2.10. And so we also need to realize the need to teach our fellow man about God and the sacrifice of Jesus. In other words, the elements of the gospel. Jesus came to this earth. He died on the cross for our sins. He, he ascended up to heaven. And then if we want to enjoy what he has offered to us, we need to hear about Jesus Christ. We need to believe Jesus Christ. We need to confess our faith in Christ. We need to repent of our sins, be baptized for the mission of sins, and then live faithfully according to his word. I mean, that, that's what it's all about. And it's our duty as Christians to tell our fellow man about God because they're not looking. I mean, they're watching the TV and getting influenced by all these influences that out there, oh, you can't have a full life unless you're drinking beer or wine. You can't have a full life unless you're involved in some such sort of sexual escapade. You can't have a full life unless you're cursing and doing all sorts of garbage. Man's not going to hear that. And honestly... They're not going to drive by and say, oh, let's stop in this church, see what they're all about. Folks, reality says that ain't going to happen. So what do we got to do? We've got to take this gospel message outside that door. We've got to take it out and share it with others. As we meet people, we talk to them. And maybe I ought to add, if we're living right, then it'll be easier to convince them that's what we believe. It doesn't do any good to tell somebody, you need to go to church if you're, if you're doing the exact same things they're doing. Imagine two people, two guys sitting in a bar, hey, buddy, you know what? You need to get yourself to church. What kind of influence is that going to have on somebody? It's not. We have to live right. We have to live right. And as Christians, we should not be content to just let people stay on the path to hell. I mean, if, if we are to be like Jesus, we are supposed to have compassion on them. And yeah, as Avery said, we need to pray for them as if their life depended on it. We need to pray for people as if their soul depended on it. And we have to realize that since we know them, there are a lot of them, maybe we have an influence on them. Maybe we can turn them to start seeking God. See, that's what we're supposed to do. I mean, we, we sent out emails of all these lessons. What do you do? You take it, and then after you read it, if you read it, you trash it, right? No. There's a little button called forward button. Send it to everybody on your list. And you don't know who that might affect. You don't know who might read something that I never thought of it that way. Maybe I should start serving the Lord. I mean, see, we're, we're talking about our example and our influence and personal evangelism, which God expects of us. If we're not trying to help people into heaven, what use are we to God? Think about that. You know, the old phrase when Jesus talked about you either bear fruit or burn. If we're not trying to help people get to heaven, what good are we? To God. Oh, but I've been going to church for 55 years and I, and I, I've made just about every service except when I was sick and, and we can talk about, oh yeah, and, and, and I support the preaching of the gospel by the preacher. But if you're not doing, if you're not involved in it, what good are you? I mean, God's happy with that preacher who's preaching the gospel and sharing his message. God's happy with that. And you sit back, well, well, I'll just encourage him, let him do it. No. All of us have that responsibility and duty to share whenever we can. We have opportunities. We have opportunities all the time. Don't let them slip away. So you can only set an example for people who see you. And you can only influence those around you. I mean, that, that's true. 
Now, now sometimes maybe if, like say, we get on Facebook, we have a, a, a few thousand followers, okay, maybe you can influence some of them, uh, but let's face it, most of, the peop- most of my friends on Facebook are already Christians, and so they just take my words, but I've got to in- encourage them to be faithful to God and to share the gospel message, because a lot of them don't do that. And so if we're going to influence our neighbors, we got to be around them. Now, we don't go join them in their partying and their revelry and everything so that we have, might look for an opening. But if we have the intention that I'm going to try and influence these people, and that's people we meet. And, you, and it doesn't mean it have to be a lot. All you have to do, maybe give them a, give them a piece of paper. Give them a card that talks about the plan of salvation. Uh, what I do, I give them a, a card of my website. They can go there and find any, about any information you want to find out. And it's there. And it's worth doing because it is doing something. Doing nothing is not going to help you at all. So that is where your world you are commanded to evangelize starts and stops. You don't have to worry about the people in Reno, Nevada, Atlanta, Georgia, or or Bangor, Maine. You're not there. You're not around them. But your world is where you are. Your ministry is where you are at that very moment. And luckily with technology, our ministry is on the Internet. Our ministry can be sometimes when, when we send out articles and, and information on the Internet, we can influence people and help them see these things. See, these people are souls that Jesus died for, and they need salvation. And we sit back and just let them walk on by? No, we shouldn't do that. We as Christians should do our part to teach our fellow man. And this starts in the home. Yeah, and continues among our co-workers, our classmates, our neighbors, our, and everyone in our community. And who is my neighbor? Avery pointed this out a couple weeks ago. Everybody in this area is our neighbor. And that's the people we need to be trying to help. Because you walk out there, you can point to anybody and say, they're not going to heaven. They're not going to heaven. They're not going to heaven. The waiter that waits on us, or waitress, they're not going to heaven. The cashier at the counter is not going to heaven. You just got to throw in that word, unless. Unless I give them an opportunity. Unless I mention something about God. And that's something we should start doing. I'm having a blessed day. God has been good to me. And all you need is somebody say, well, he hasn't been good to me. I said, well, let's talk about that. That's all we have to do. See, we, we cannot teach or influence those who do not know us and those we do not meet. Unless, like I say, we meet on the Internet. I mean, we, we do that. We have Zoom. We have uh, Facebook. We have the, the videos on Facebook and stuff like that. And, okay, those people might meet us. But, like I said, just like you know all the residents of Bangor, Maine. No, we can't influence them. (sighs) See, God has told his people to be sober-minded. And we'll just have a few passages. An elder is supposed to be sober-minded, Titus 1, 8. And uh, uh, Titus 2, 2, the aged men are to be sober, grave, temperate. And what are they supposed to do? Teach the younger men and older women. They're to be, teach the young women to be sober. I mean, sober, keep your mind straight. Older men teach the younger men. Encourage them, exhort them to be sober-minded. And 1 Peter 1.13, Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And 1 Peter 4.7, But the end of all things is at hand. Be ye therefore sober. And watch unto prayer. First Peter 5, 8. Be sober. Be vigilant. Because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. 
See, God has told his people to pay attention to their surroundings and walk accordingly. We got to see what's going on and we got to walk with caution. He said, therefore, be careful how you walk, not as unwise men, but as wise. And we are to walk. This I say, Ephesians 4, 17, that, and affirm together with the Lord that you walk no longer just as the Gentiles also walk in the futility of their mind. And who are the Gentiles? Everybody is not a Christian. That's who they are. All right, Ephesians 4, 1. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you're called. God called us to share the gospel message. We're supposed to walk worthy of that. I mean, Colossians 1, 10, that you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Do we walk worthy of Christ? I mean, do we walk and live and, and walk in the New Testament basically means your behavior, your lifestyle. Do we live in a way that is worthy of the Lord, worthy of the Lord's acceptance? I mean, that, that's 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 where we got to start right there. Examine ourselves and make sure I'm a, I got to be doing right. Then I can tell others how to be doing right. See, the people have spoken and have rejected God and his laws. We know that's the case. And the righteous can tuck tail and hide, or they can share the gospel message and start saving souls. We're not going to save a million souls. Like, like, like I said, some people say, well, I want to go out and evangelize the world. No, you start one soul at a time. And you look for opportunities. And if you got 15 people at that one at a time, at least I've said something to them, at least I've I've told them I got a Bible study going on or I got this going on, inviting them to church. I can have 15 people on the hook there and say, hey, okay, maybe they said they'd come. Maybe they will one of these days, but they're still there. We've still asked. One soul at a time is what it's going to take. And reality tells us we are not going to save them all, but we can at least try to save some. That's what we're sowing to. So, are you going to get real? Like I say, are you going to get real about your salvation? Are you going to get real about your duty to God? Are you going to get real about the way you live and your faithfulness? I mean, that, that, that's, that's why we're talking about reality check. Because a lot of us, if we are honest, we can probably all say no if we're honest with ourselves. No. And even those who do things, even those who preach the gospel, even those who uh, do things and, and help people on the Internet, we have to be honest enough to say, well, I, I, I've sent my message out to millions of people on the Internet, but I haven't walked across to my neighbor and spoken to them. So, folks... We all got improvement to make. And since we just started a new year, it's not too late to get started. If it's worth making a resolution about, don't wait until the first of the year. Just start right away. That's what we need to do. But that's our lesson this morning. I, I hope it's impacted you to the point that you'll get busy doing something for the master that maybe you haven't done before. And I encourage you to do that because your soul is, is laying in the balance. It's your soul. And I don't want to see any of you lose your soul. And it doesn't matter. The fact that you're sitting in this room is not what matters. Fact is, am I doing something for God? That's what matters. And, and so, yeah, we, we have to make sure we are doing our duty to God and helping others get into a relationship with him. So that's our lesson. We're going to sing an invitation song, and, and we've talked about the gospel plan of salvation, and we encourage those who might be watching, if you have questions, uh, send us questions, and we'll, we'll do our best to answer them with book, chapter, and verse, and what God has to say. We won't give you our opinion. We'll tell you what God has to say. So consider these thoughts, and, and anybody subject to the gospel invitation, we invite you to come while we stand and sing.